It was a forest ranger that had called it in. She'd been found at the edge of an isolated campsite in the well-known National Forest. The campers, horrified, called 911 when they saw my sister emerge from the forest on all fours, caked in dirt and blood. She was so starved and deformed that the campers told 911 that an emaciated bear was tearing apart their cooler and fisting handfuls of raw meat. The forest ranger who found her was from the same small town as us of Grofield, California, about 26 miles outside of Yosemite National Park. He recognized, under all that dirt and grime, the orange guest shirt from the story of the girl who went missing in his graduating class. And that's when he called my parents. I wasn't with them when they got the call from the local hospital that the forest ranger had immediately transported my sister to. I was nearby at Community Business College. It had been my 21st birthday last night, and I'd woken up with a monstrous hangover. My bed was strewn with bottles of Everclear and Malibu, and a thin layer of a fine powder of something covered my nightstand. I immediately downed a Xanax, chasing it with a black cherry white claw. The only time I'd left my apartment all day was when DoorDash dropped off my McDonald's meal of shame, and I had to meet them at my building's gate. They, they found your sister. My mother was incoherent on the phone. I could barely hear her over her hysterical sobbing. She's at Tulum General Hospital. You, you need to come immediately. We'll pay for an Uber. I felt my body go cold. That's not possible. I whispered. It's been 15 years since she disappeared. It's not her. It's her. She was hysterically crying. They did a DNA test. It's her. She's alive. There was a reporter waiting outside the hospital as I pulled up. The forest ranger had let it slip to his girlfriend that distress call he answered was for Paula Richards, the girl that went missing in their high school class, and the news had gotten out. Girlfield was small, with a population of only 1,000 people. And it was a one stoplight kind of town, with the police station on one end and the forest on the other. Everybody knew everybody. They were my school teachers, nurses, babysitters, and the local candy shop owners. And as with any small town, they protected their own and kept everybody else out. Grovefield keeps its business close, and its people even closer as my grandfather used to say. So when my sister disappeared 15 years ago, Grofield kept the news quiet. Only one lone reporter from the nearby town of Jamestown caught wind of what was happening and snuck into Grofield for the story. This is what he reported. 15 years ago, almost to the day, Paula Richards disappeared without a trace during a hike with a parent's sister. She was beautiful, beloved, and a rising star in the high school track star with D2 universities competing to sign her. It was her spring break, and she was on a week-long camping trip with her parents and younger sister in the nearby Yosemai National Park. Her parents were avid outdoorsmen, as they backpacked and camped all over the majority of U.S. national parks, and had instilled that same preparedness and love for the wilderness into 15-year-old Paula. On the day of her disappearance, it was a Monday morning, and they were hiking to Glacier Point, using the Taft Point and the Fisher's Trail. The trail they'd chosen was mostly flat. It was a two-mile-long hike through wildflower-filled meadows, before dipping through the occasional patch of thick woods and leading to the south rim of Yosemai Valley. Paula and her parents could handle it no problem, but Amy, Paula's six-year-old sister, kept wanting to turn back. In hindsight, this trail was probably too difficult for a six-year-old, especially since, according to the police reports, her parents had reportedly claimed that Amy slept poorly the night before, crying that she could hear something crawling outside her tent. According to the parents, about 20 minutes in, Amy started sobbing hysterically, like 
full-on frenzied screams, dug her heels into the dirt, and refused to step an inch further into the forest. At this point, Paula and her family were standing in a low wildflower-filled valley, right at the edge of a patch of dense forest. That's when Paula volunteered to take her back. Her parents agreed. Paula clipped Amy's leash to her own backpack and turned to walk back. Their campsite was less than a mile away. Her parents felt confident, assured that Paula, who had been thoroughly coached in wilderness survival and first aid, could handle that short walk back. Paula was last seen wearing a bright orange guest long sleeve t-shirt, something she'd deliberately worn since it was visible from miles away. Eight minutes later, they heard Paula scream. Gone. Vanished. With only her sobbing, incoherent, hysterical younger sister left to tell her parents what happened. As I pulled up to the entrance, the reporter spotted me, and he descended like flies to a dead body. Miss Richards, Amy Richards, have you seen your sister yet? How is she? Is she talking? Can she tell us what happened? His camera bulbs popped and flashed, blinding me, and I was momentarily disoriented. Suddenly, I felt a grip on my arm. Move, you fucking asshole. I was yanked unceremoniously from the Uber and away from the horrendous reporter. You okay, hon? That goddamn guy must have been out there all day, hassling anybody going in or out. It was my dad's friend, Ron, an EMT at this hospital. Hiya, Ron. I'm okay. I shrugged. After all, it's not like this is my first time. He eyed me carefully. Right, so I guess, uh... Is it really her? I mustered a grin. Apparently so. According to the DNA test my parents had done immediately. I think Tom, the family lawyer, is checking again, though. How, after fifteen years? He trailed off, noticing the look on my face. Hey, are you sure you're doing okay? I faked a lighthearted chuckle. <laughs> Thank you for caring, but don't worry about me. Doing my best to keep mental breakdowns to a minimum. Speaking of which... Where is she? Room 82, third floor. He hesitated. Amy. Yes? Please be careful. My face felt tight as I forced a grin. Don't you worry, Ronnie. I pointed to the silver locket from my childhood around my neck. I've got my lucky charm right here. Well, it certainly looked like her, but like a gaunt, emaciated, withered version of what I had always imagined my sister would look like. It hurt to look at her. Her blue eyes, dulled, sunk low in their sockets. Her cheeks were painfully sunken too, giving her the overall look of a walking, breathing skeleton. Her skin was ashy red from what I could see, covered in open sores. Her beautiful blonde ringlets from my memory were gone. Her hair was horribly thinned, with only a light fringe left on her crown. I pushed past my parents and through the crowd of nurses and specialists. My stomach twisted and churned from anxiety. Fuck, she was awake. Hey, big. Sissy? I said slowly, using my old nickname for her. Do you remember me? It's been a while. She didn't look like how I remembered. Instead of the bright, beautiful older sister, a broken shell had returned to us. She also smelled horrible, pungent, rangy, and ripe, like a dead body that's been left to rot in the sun. I, uh brought you something. I pulled it from my pocket. It was a bag of Hershey's Kisses. Remember how much you used to like these? I fought back tears. She was staring up at me, blinkingly, 
Every few seconds or so, her right eye would twitch. Without breaking eye contact, she slowly reached for it. My heart twisted. She was missing all the fingernails on her right hand. Amy Richards? I whipped around. Yes? It was her doctor. Could you please step outside for a moment? He held a clipboard for me. If you're going to be visiting, I need you to sign these forms. Visiting hours was written in bold on the first page. What's this? I asked. Dr. Jenkins pointed at Paula. It's for her. Her visiting hours are going to be limited. After spending 15 years away from civilization, her natural immune system would be overwhelmed by even the most basic viral infection. Plus, we'll be starting treatment for her leukemia soon, and... Wait. Leukemia? I gasped. She has cancer? Dr. Jenkins paused and glanced first to his colleagues. Dr. J was a family friend. He'd been both me and Paula's primary doctor for years, and my parents loved him. Stage one or two. He said in hushed tones. We're not sure, but still very treatable. Although in her condition, recovery's going to be tough. I glanced over. Paula was still staring at me. I pulled out my pill bottle and popped another little white bar. Doc, what happened to her? I felt my heart tearing apart in two. She looks like she's... decaying. Dr. Jenkins watched me swallow the pill, but said nothing. He looked pensive, worried. Amy, she's severely malnourished. Whatever she was eating out there wasn't enough. She's severely dehydrated too. We suspect she has severe anemia, but won't know for certain until more tests come back. That's it? Just severe anemia? There's also evidence of a significant brain injury here at the base of her skull. He pointed to the back of his head. It's healed now, but at some point she sustained a deep, blunt force injury. He sighed. We think that's why she didn't find her way out. The concussion she sustained would have scrambled her sense of direction. That, plus the terrible winters and the lack of nutrients. It affects more than just the body. It affects the mind, too. I glanced over at her. Paula was still watching me through the little glass window in her hospital room. The baby hairs on the back of my neck were tingling. You saying she went crazy? What I'm saying is... He sighed again. <sighs> well, we can only imagine what happened to her out there. After a week in the hospital, my parents wanted her home. It was like they were afraid she'd disappear again. The doctors fought against it, of course, said her health was extremely fragile and needed constant, round-the-clock care. My parents, willing to compromise but unwilling to back down completely, hired a live-in nurse to keep track of Paula's treatment. Because Paula was still pretty bedridden, the nurse gave Paula a bell to ding when she needed assistance. Paula's room was right next to mine and I could hear the bell ringing, ringing at all hours of the night. It was making me reconsider my decision to stay for the next couple of months. Paula's room was exactly the same way as it was 15 years ago. Pink walls covered in NSY and C posters, Bow Wow and Backstreet Boys, and a signed poster of our all-time hero, Michael Jordan. An enormous corkboard filled with ribbons and Polaroid pictures with her teammates was hung over her desk. Big white beanbags lay stacked in the corner, and there were piles of CDs scattered in a semicircle around them. My parents had preserved her room, like a butterfly in amber, so that everything was exactly how she left. It's like they were waiting for her to come home. It's why we never moved from her childhood home in Grofield, too. Even when things became unbearable, when the small town scrutiny became too much, my parents still refused to let go. It was incredibly eerie. About a week after my parents took my sister home from the hospital, 
I was coming home from the local library when I walked in to see police in my living room. When my sister disappeared, her story rocked her town. She was a beloved, brilliant, and talented teenager who babysat for all the new mothers and helped organize church picnics and book clubs, and she had gone missing in broad daylight. The sole witness and absolute last person to see her alive was her hysterical, inconsolable younger sister, who, unfortunately, couldn't remember a thing. The police suspected my dad at first. They hauled him in, despite the fact he had a solid alibi and was clearly beside himself over her disappearance. The town branded him a killer, that he was running a sex slave ring in the wilderness and was feeding the girls to a cannibal cult. The police eventually had to release a statement admitting their fault in suspecting him, but the rumors continued to spread. After all, the truth isn't what people care about. What did the cops want? My mom had her head buried in her arms, and my dad was pacing around the kitchen. They want to know what we know. My father said, sitting down at the table. And if we had any more information. What did you tell them? I asked pensively. That, well, that she's back home. That she somehow got confused and lost out there and, and survived 15 years on her own despite all her efforts to find her, only to make it back to the same place she, she originally disappeared from, and that the young forest ranger recognized her from high school. But he shook his head. Fuck, I think we should do an interview. We say our piece, we give them a headline, and then the town will calm down. We can't let it escalate like... Last time, we have to control the narrative. Set the record straight. I snorted. Dad, it's been 15 years. I'm pretty sure there's no record anymore. Plus... I continued, my voice breaking. What's the story going to be about? That we brought this stranger home? She barely eats. She doesn't sleep. I said, sick to my stomach. I haven't seen her sleep once, and she doesn't even speak to us. Not to one word. My mother's sobs punctured the tension like gunshots. Don't, don't, don't call her a stranger. She hiccuped loudly and took another swig from the bottle she was holding. We have been given a second chance from God to be whole again. The last 15 years. Snot and tears streaked across her flushed face. Our angel has come back to us. We are fixing our broken family. If only, if, if only she hadn't. A painfully familiar, overwhelming sense of frustration suddenly boiled hot in my stomach. If only what, mother? If only I hadn't made her turn back with me? I watched as she desperately avoided eye contact. Is that what you were going to say? She opened her mouth to retort, but the damage was done. I knocked the whiskey bottle that had become a permanent fixture in her hands for the last 15 years and stormed upstairs. Suddenly, I heard a gentle knock at my door. It had been a few hours since it stormed upstairs and I half expected my dad to storm up after me, but... But nothing. Go away. I moaned. I heard shuffling outside like someone was dragging their feet. My ears perked up and I felt my skin start to crawl. Hello? Who is it? For a second I thought it was Amelia, the nurse we'd hired. But no, she actually had the night off tonight. Again, another gentle knock. Hello? I said again, this time louder. My heart leapt into my throat. Without further ado, I jumped off the bed and strode over to my door and whipped it open. Nothing. I looked down. Suddenly, a wave of bile threatened to rise from my stomach. In the carpet right outside my door lay a small, crushed wildflower. I knew what everyone thought, that it was my fault my sister disappeared that I was hiding something because I couldn't tell the cops what I'd seen, that I was lying when I said I didn't know what happened. But the truth is, it wasn't that I couldn't tell the cops, 
it was that I had already tried and they didn't believe me. When my parents heard Paula scream, they came sprinting back but it was already too late. Paula was gone and I was curled up in the hollow of a tree with the yellow backpack leash wrapped around my throat. The leash was bloodstained and torn and caught deep in the threads of the nylon were five fresh fingernails torn at the root. DNA testing later determined that they were Paula's fingernails. I don't remember much from that day, but when my parents would reluctantly recount the story for me, they would say I kept saying one thing over and over. It was a deer monster, Mama. A deer monster took Paula. My parents took me to therapy about a month after her disappearance. My mother didn't believe in therapy, saying it was against God and the church. But seeing how depressed and withdrawn I'd gotten, she agreed to give it a chance. My mother refused to let me see anybody local. She was afraid of what I'd say and what would spread around town. So the police had to bring in someone from three towns away. Our session lasted only 15 minutes and my mother never took me back again. I'd been sitting there, drawing, when the therapist walked in. The police and my parents were watching through the two-way mirror. I only remember that the room was cold and white and that the crayons had been the brightest thing in that room. They told me to draw what I saw that day, and I did. There was a small stick figure for me, a big stick figure for Paula, and something else too. A towering figure with deep red eyes and horns that stood so close to Paula they were practically touching. In fact, I'd drawn them holding hands. It took up almost the entire page. Hi, Amy. The therapist said, her bright tone trying to hide the level of concern that was bleeding through. What is this? The devil took Paula. I said simply. That's what I saw. My mother, beside herself, told me from therapy. I was given a prescription for duloxetine and Xanax instead. I was only six years old, so of course, I had a hard time adjusting to the medication. Maybe that's why I was awake that particular night. It was a couple of days after the fateful therapy session, and I found myself suddenly wide awake at three in the morning. There was a full moon. I looked outside. There was a girl standing at her back fence. It was dark, but in the light of the full moon I could see her bright orange, long-sleeved guest shirt. It was as if she felt me looking at her. Her head snapped towards me, moving at a shockingly fast speed. She waved. I stood there, frozen, unable to wave back. She waved again. Then slowly she pointed to the fence. It was as if she wanted me to come unlock it. I didn't move. I shook my head again, harder. I remember her watching me for a minute, for five minutes, then for what felt like an hour. Then slowly, she turned around and walked away. Her head rolled loosely on her neck, flopping around as if it couldn't stay upright. It had been almost six hours since I stormed upstairs, but I hadn't yet left my room. I thought about it, considered running for the door. I thought about texting my only friend, my dealer, and telling him to pick me up. But every time, I chickened out. <laughs> I'd run later, but right now, I could hear her pacing right outside my door. <laughs>